when you see them videos of these little babies at birthday parties and they out there dancing and they quoting songs from sexy red and people like that that's how you see that scripture in today's society you are not instructing your children in the ways of the most high god you allow them to be offered up to the gods of this earth right ready read no just joking. all right all right y'all i'm back all right so deuteronomy chapter 12 this is this is where it's gonna start getting even better i mean it's all good the spirit is flowing um but deuteronomy chapter 12 is where we start to get into the first aspects as we start to break down the laws of the most high god and what it is he is teaching us and leading us to do so that we can bear witness to who we belong to and the fact that he is the one true living god who is wise above all things all right so deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 1 and it reads it says these are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the lord god of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree and you shall destroy their altars break their sacred pillars and burn their wooden images with fire you shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their altars, their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things, but you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go. There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all to which you have put your hand, you and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not at all do as we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as yet you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, then there will be a, the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in a place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. However, you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates. Whatever your heart desires, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you, the unclean and the clean may eat of it, of the gazelle and the deer alike. Only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd or your flock of any of your offerings which you vow of your free will offerings or of the heave offering of your hand but you must eat them before the lord your god in the place which the lord your god chooses you and your son and your daughter your male servant and your female servant and the levite who is within your gates and you shall rejoice before the lord your god in all to which you put your hands Take heed to yourself that you do not forsake the Levite as long as you live in your land. When the Lord your God has enlarges your border as he has promised you, and you say, Let me eat meat. Because you long to eat meat, you may eat as much meat as your heart desires. If the one place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from, the, from your herd and your flock, which the Lord has given you just as I have commanded you. And you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires. Just as the gazelle and the deer are eaten, so you may eat them. The unclean and the clean alike may eat them. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is the life, that you may not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it, you shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it, that it may go well with you and your children after you, when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Only the holy things which you have in your vowed offerings you shall take and go to the place which the Lord chooses. You shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God, and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you, your children, after you forever. 
when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Verse 29. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess and you displace them and dwell in their land, take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I will do so likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord which he hates they have done to their gods, for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. That you shall and you shall not add to it nor take away from it. All right. So, a lot of good stuff that we're gonna break down. And my prayer, as always, is that the Father will let you, that the Spirit will speak, right? Because the law is spiritual. The Book of Romans says the law is spiritual. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills; it brings death to the flesh, but the Spirit behind the letter gives life to your spirit, right? So, what are we gonna do? We're going to pull the spirit out of this bad boy. We're going to pull the spirit out so that way we get the understanding of the principle and the wisdom that is here. So that way we can apply it to our lives because people don't understand how this stuff translates and remains in effect today. Because we, we see with our natural eye and not our spirit, right? And our flesh naturally is going to run from these things. As human beings, we avoid things we don't understand. We fear things we don't understand. And we typically put to death things that we feel are different or make us uncomfortable. These the, the, the laws of the Father are designed to make your flesh uncomfortable. So that way you do what's necessary to, to re alleviate that discomfort. And the discomfort is alleviated through subjecting that flesh to the power of the Spirit. Right? Alright, so verse number two. Right? He tells it straight up in verse one. These are the statutes and the judgments. So he's like, look, boom, I'm about to go ahead and start breaking them down to you. All right, verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall, dispos uh, you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy your names, their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place. And there you shall go. Right. These passages are very straightforward. Right. What is said here is is, is the very same thing we just read in the, in the end of the chapter. It's like when you come into the land that the father's given you. Right. And we just hit on it in the, in the last video as well. When you're coming into the things that he's given you and you see other people serving other gods, serving other deities. Right. The law breaks it down. This is talking about horoscopes. This is talking about tarot cards. This is people who are seeking out psychics. People even in our day and age, you got the social media things where people click on it. And it's like uh, it gives you like little predictions and different things like that. These are all different forms of faith. Right. People get into all these debates where you got people that are denouncing certain things or that are coming out of certain uh, lifestyles or certain forms of worship. And they're saying, hey, child of the most high. These things that I am coming out of, I am telling you from personal experience, these are of the enemy. These are not of the Most High God of Israel. These are of the kingdom of darkness. You should stay away. And typically what you see is everybody wants to, like those who are not of the spirit are coming out and debating with people who are coming out with the testimony where the father himself pulled them out of it and gave them a commission to come and speak. Right? The same way he said, Moses, go and tell these people X, Y, Z. He called these people to denounce these things, to come out of these organizations, to come out of these faith systems and expose them and say, hey, this is what this really is. You as a believer or a child of God, if you profess to be one, should not be engaging with it because of what the father has said about it. But individuals will come and they will argue you down and there'll be all of these debates on social media and all these things about People's own interpretation. Well, I feel this and this is why I don't like the church because they're so judgment. And there's all these debates. But all of that debating is cut short when you just bust open the scriptures and come to the laws of the Father. And you say, look, I ain't even got to debate you about what you feel, what your emotionally charged opinion is, right? All of that stuff doesn't matter about why you disagree with someone's testimony if their testimony is the truth. When I cross-reference it from the scriptures, the scripture says, destroy that stuff. Destroy their altars, their sacred pillars, their wooden images. Cut down their carved images and destroy the names of their gods from that place. How do you do that in this day and time? This Back then, like the arches and stuff was real. They legit had temples and everything. Now, P 
people's temples, like the body. Everyone tell you, like, this is my temple. The scriptures will tell you if you're a child of the Most High God and Christ is in you, you are the temple of the Father. But if you are outside of Christ, that can very well be your temple. But it's also a temple that's probably offering up things of yourself and of your life to all of these different gods, these different idols and different things like that, right? Altars exist in the digital space and everything in this day and age, right? So you go back, you look at your 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 your, your Twitter feed, TikTok feed, Facebook feed, what all, all of these, the algorithm, all that stuff is showing you what is on the altars of your heart. It is showing you the altars and the temples and the things that you have set up to these false gods and these different systems of worship. And it reveals to you the things that need to be broken down. So Father is saying, when I send you into this land, when I bring you into this land, right? When I take you from carnality to spirit, when the blood of Christ has made you fresh and made you clean, those things that you see other people doing, you need to tear those things down, right? You have to approach it with a different mindset because the Most High said in verse 4, you shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. They worship like that. We don't worship like that. They might do X, Y, and Z. The Most High said, I don't care what they do. Don't do that for me. I don't care how you used to serve them gods before you came here, but you don't serve me like that. A lot of these other faith systems deal with aspects where it's like, it's kind of like do what you want. And the Father said, it's not do what you want. It's do what I say. Right? And then continuing on. In verse 5, it says, But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes, put his name as dwelling, and there you should go, right? Seek you first his kingdom and his righteousness. The Father desires us to seek out the things. He desires us to seek out his stuff, right? It says, There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and your flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. You shall rejoice in all which you have put your hand you and your households in which the Lord your God has blessed you, right? People ask about the offering aspects, right? We know that the Messiah himself is that sin offering, that, that offering of atonement, right? But you also get into the passages where the scriptures talk about like the incense offerings, right? And then Revelation talks about the prayers of the saints coming out as a sweet, savory incense between the Most High God. So you have to understand that these systems of sacrifice still exist and as you're talking about the concept of what these look like, right, you can get the connotation of what the spirit is trying to communicate to us, right? So your time, your essence, your energy, your finances, the things that you do, because a lot of the things that, that are the scripture outlines, right, when it deals with the animals and the different things, these were different things that, that had value during that time. Because of the modern currency system, it's difficult for us to process how these things translate but a lot of that stuff that was translated or or was viewed as like the the tithes and the, and the heave offerings the devout offerings and different things like that these are things that they were given up right and when you see this most high talking about like the cattle and the herbs and i will enlarge your territory and different things like that like these possessions were given to them as wealth right so what the father is saying and how that translates to us today is the same exact way so you have to understand how did what they viewed as wealth correlate to what we view as wealth or possessions is a better term today right so like it could be your vehicle it could be your house like when we call it be hospitable it could be the food in your house right all these different things right and when we commit that stuff unto the lord what that means is we allow him to dictate how we dispossess those things how we utilize those things in this earth Obviously, he tells us in these passages, eat freely and enjoy the things that he has given us of our possession, right? However, there's also a call and a mandate on us as children of the Most High God to take care of our brothers and sisters in the faith, in the community, and those who are outside of the faith. The Most High still calls us to be vessels of honor and deal with them according to the law that produces life, to give them a glimpse of of the reality of Christ, to get them a, grim, a glimpse of the reality of who the Most High God is, if this is making sense, right? All right, so yeah, so I, so, so just breaking down, so I'll give you guys an example as far as with ties, right? Because, let me see, actually, where is it? Okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna touch on ties in a little bit because I got an aspect, right? Uh, and ties I'm gonna touch on once we get into like the next verse. But um and I'll show I'm gonna tell you guys how my family does our tithes and different things like that, right? But vowed offerings and different things, free will offerings, like you you hear Paul talking about the free will offering and different things like that, like giving freely, 
right, of all things. That's an aspect where you see like the New Testament correlation, right? But let's jump back down here. All right, so verse 8 is a, is a key scripture. It says, you shall not do at all as we are doing today, here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. This is a powerful verse because this connects with a verse that we've heard before where it says there is a way that seems right in a man's eyes, but the end thereof is death. The wages of sin is death. So what that scripture is telling us and in line with here is saying that there's a way that you are living or you can make decisions and be conducting your life that you feel like is right. But the wages of it is death because the end thereof is death, because ultimately whatever pattern of life you have that is ongoing is in contradiction to the laws of the father. It's a transgression of the scriptures, right? This is where we start to see things like where Crowley says stuff like do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's how you can discern that the kingdom of darkness speaks to get you to be in direct opposition to the text of the scriptures, right? Verse 8 it says, you shall not do what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. So when the mouth of Satan speaks to somebody like Crowley and he says, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, which means do whatever you want is, is what the law will be made into. Right. That's a direct contradiction because the scripture says you're not going to do that. And the reason why the father is telling us that is because he told us before this stuff is for your good. He's saying and he's echoed it in the other passages because the end of that lifestyle is death. The end of living like that is death because of the wages of what it produces. Right. This is where you start hearing things of that's not my conviction. Right. A lot of people like to use that term, especially in the modern body of Christ. But that becomes that comes from an aspect of what you see passages where it talks about they won't heed sound doctrine. Right. But the itching ears, they will have the itching ears and they will seek out those doctrines. And the Internet makes it so easy where you don't have to fellowship with a body of Christ that has accountability and it can check and, and discern and different things like that. What it allows you to do is go and find things and the algorithm will do that for you. It will produce information based on your searches, based on your conversations, based on your texts. It will it, it, it will scan all of that and say, hey, this is what you want to see. And so it will continue to feed those itching ears and it will give those self-fulfilling prophecies and, and, and feed that confirmation bias that you might walk in. And it makes it easier to say, well, that's not my conviction, because now you have over personalized your walk with the father. A personal relationship with the Messiah doesn't mean I like this, so I'm going to walk in this. I don't like that, so I'm not going to walk in that. Like, because now you're making a tailor made faith, uh, faith that's customized to you. That means that you are God. You have made yourself the most high God in that situation because you have discerned, you have made yourself the judge of what is right and what is wrong. And the Bible never said you are the judge of what is right and what is wrong. It says you can exercise righteous judgment once you have purified yourself. But the righteous judgment that we use to execute judgment or to discern the situation is the scripture. Bind them to your right hand, frontless of your head, like your forehead. That situation we talked about in the last passage, right? That is how you exercise judgment. So it's not you discerning what is right and what is wrong. It's the most high God of Israel discerning what is right and what is wrong. And the reason why there's so much confusion in the earth is because the enemy has done a very good job of saying that this is done away with. When you remove the law, when you remove the law of God, which is a standard, there is no standard. If you remove a standard, you can't hold people accountable. When you can't hold people accountable, what does it produce? If you take away a law, uh, if you take away a, a, a law of system, a, a, a system of laws from a nation, it becomes anarchy. It is no longer a nation. It is a wasteland because everyone is going to do whatever they want to do. That is a dysfunctional society. Laws in place keep structure. So when the Most High gave us this stuff to govern his kingdom, that's exactly what it did. It creates structure and it has a base. It creates a standard of living to affect the quality of life of a believer. But it also helps you to recognize what belongs and what doesn't belong. All right. To keep you from falling into traps such as that's not my conviction or I'm going to do what I want to do. Especially when there's individuals who have, write, have written books for the kingdom of darkness that has said the whole of the law shall be this. Right? 
the goal of Satan is to remove the law of God, to remove the law of God so you will seat yourself in his position and you will decide for yourself what you feel is right and what you feel is wrong. And that's never how it was supposed to be. The father will always teach us. He has always decided to teach us. And that was always the plan that he had to teach us and to lead us and to instruct us in his way. That's why it says you shall love the Lord, the Lord your God and walk in all his ways. This verse eight is saying don't you're walking in your way when you do that and your decision, your way, your lack of conviction, for better of a term, could be the very thing that is leading you to death and producing so much death and dysfunction in your life. That's why the relationships are broken. That's why the families are broken. That's why you can't keep a job. That's why it seems like nothing is every because it, you're walking in a pattern of life that is contrary to the wisdom of God. But in your mind, you feel like it's wise. You feel like it's good. But all it's doing is producing death. So if all it's doing is producing death, it might be time to take a step back and reevaluate the decisions and the, the, the standard that you're using to evaluate the decisions that you're making because your judgment might be off. And that's the thing. The father understands human judgment is prone to error. So he said, because I am the most high God of Israel and my judgment is flawless, let me help. Let me let me give you some tools that will train your brain to judge righteously and to understand when you are making an erroneous judgment, if that makes sense. All right. Verse 9, for as yet you have not come to the rest and inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there will be a place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. Then you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. Right? This is a this is a solid passage because remember, I want to say it's the woman at the well with the Messiah right here. When he was like, the time is coming where you won't do X, Y, and Z, but all will worship in spirit and truth. Because she was she was looking like where where do I go and make this offering? Where do I go and make the sacrifice? And he was like, look, the time is coming when all that's not gonna matter because you have to worship in spirit and truth, right? This is one of those aspects he's talking about, right? Verse twelve, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. You and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levite who is within your gates, since he has no portion nor inheritance with you. So all those super mega past prosperity people who claim to be Levites, right? Who who I won't get into all that, but that's that's how you kill the prosperity gospel. Well, I'm entitled to X, Y, and Z. If if you are in a position where you are legit doing ministry to that degree and you are going to the community and like like you're leveraging what is there for the work of the kingdom. That's one thing, but a lot of people who are self-professed Levites in a situation where like there are these heavily influential individuals that lead in the, the contemporary church, right? They sit on money, which is a contradiction to the scripture because they claim to be in a position where the most High said, if you're in that position, you have no inheritance in the earth. The people are to take care of your needs, right? But they're to take care of your needs, not your wants. You're not supposed to live lavishly on that aspect. If you place yourself in that position, that's the mandate that you have called yourself on. And if you are in that position and you claim to be that, then it's either you deal with that on your own, right? Because you are in clear violation, right? Verse 13, take heed to yourself that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every place that you see, but in a place which the Lord chooses and one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings and there you shall do all that I command you, right? Verse 13 and 14 this ties back to what I was talking about earlier in verse 6, where it says, There you shall take your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings of your hand, your vowed offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of their flocks. The caveat with that is the Father says, Don't offer your stuff in every place that you see, right? And this is just a personal testimony. With This is something that the Father, when I first was coming into understanding, this is how you know the Holy Spirit confirms the, the scriptures, Right? Before I had even encountered these verses, the Father was already impressing it upon my spirit through his Holy Spirit, right? That as I was visiting different congregations and churches and trying to find where he wanted to place me, there's some places where I would feel compelled to, to release a tithe or offering. And there's a lot of places I went, he'd be like, no, don't sow seed here. Don't, don't bring that here, right? If they were pure, regardless of understanding and, and where things were, if their heart was pure and everything about what they were doing had alignment with the heart and the will of the father to the degree of what the understanding to according to the faith that was given unto them right the father will 
impress it upon me like this is a place where you can sow your seed you can sow your offering right but a lot of times i didn't have money like i used to be homeless and different things so what i would be able to offer was my time the gifts that the father had given me right i'm able to do video editing audio editing i'm able to do art writing like i'm able to do a lot of different things i'm a hard worker i have good ethics and all these different things right and so there's an aspect where if i didn't have finances to contribute i would contribute of myself if that makes sense. That which I did have, like you see in the book of Acts, people took what they had and they brought it. What I had, I brought. The widow's might, right? But the father started getting on me. He was like, look, don't do that everywhere you go. And the purpose for that is because everywhere that you go, it may look like he established it. It may look like it's a good place to pour out. It may look like it's a good place to bring your offering. But he says not to do it. And typically the reason why he says not to do it in every place you see, because every place you see that might look like it's something doesn't mean he established it. It may not be the place that he has told you to go. It may not be the place that he has established. So he says, look, go to the places that I will tell you to go. Bring your offerings to the place that I will show you, to the places that I will teach you, to the places that I have set my name up. And there's a lot of places that look like altars and they have all these different pillars and it's strange fire to different gods. And he's like, don't pour of your time. Don't pour of your energy. Don't offer of yourself or anything that I have given you there because that, I am not there. I don't care what they name themselves. I am not there. Right? So be led by the spirit to move like that. Now, the danger with that is you also have a lot of believers, right? Because of the corruption that they've seen, they don't do any tithe. They don't do any offering or anything along those lines. And that's a violation and the transgression of the commandment. How do you know, right? And I'll just say this because you got people who yield to the laws of the Father, right? They're Torah observant. But because of aspects of the New Testament, it, it starts to produce a level of confusion. Because if for lack of a better term, it starts to become cherry picking. And they'll be like, okay, well, the tithe was X, Y, and Z. And we know the Bible doesn't really... The New Testament, they just talk about offerings and different things like that. Man, sometimes, look, they talk from the Old Testament. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like if... If the Old Testament talk about tithes, it was it was understood that that was something that was done, right? If you struggle to understand why the father had tithes, like the, the tithe for the storehouse was so that in times of like famine and drought and different things like that, those who had need could receive of what the need was there. Now, when you see them talking about in the book of Acts where they were selling off all of their excess so that no one had want, that's how it should be. That is a free will offering. Those are the offerings that it ties into like the father says, the body of like you offer that stuff up in the body of Christ. We like we are the temples, right? So you bring that stuff so that everyone has need, but it serves the same. It's the same spirit of what we read in verse six about those offerings. You're bringing that stuff up. It gives your skills and your talents for the benefit of the body of Christ to build up the kingdom, right? The tithe is equivalent to the taxation system. I'm not going to get into no debate where people you could talk about what you want regarding taxes. I don't care about that. That's not what I'm talking about, right? That's a distraction. The taxes initially are to help the fund the, the infrastructure of a society. They are to go to fund the programs that take care of the people who are disabled, unable, or need help. Right? That's why you see a lot of the welfare or the, the, the social socially funded projects are funded through taxpayer money, right? Public servants like law enforcement firefighters and different things like that is funding through the taxes because they're taking care of the people by by default of their occupation the tithe is the same type of taxation system in the body of christ and this is the purpose for the tithe man the reason why taxes have to exist is because people are so selfish right they're not going to willfully give up money that they feel like they worked hard earned for to give to other individuals to help keep their lifestyle of comfort or whatever they have established going. People will not, like you can go and say, hey, we're doing a, look at fundraisers. Hey, we're fundraising to, 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 to get the city roads repaved. We need to raise $10 million. Ain't nobody trying to give to that. Hey, there's orphans out here who are starving. We have a fundraiser. We're trying to raise $150,000. They might raise $500. It's not in the heart of people right to do stuff like that so in so many ways before they even see that money that money has to be collected right distributed out and then when it's around tax returns he's like oh okay so we got this up front 
based off of how you did, this is how much we owe you if we owe you anything. Right? It's an aspect where that stuff is collected so it can go to fund the different programs. People will give to fundraisers like that if they are trying to, if they have a self-motivated interest, well, it's going to be a tax break. So let me give to this charity. Like the, the fact that people have to have a self-interest to motivate to do the right thing of selflessness, it shows you that they're not really selfless. They're still selfish. They're thinking at themselves at the core of what it is they're doing, right? The same thing goes with tithes. They're, like the body of Christ, when you make tithes like that, when people have the option to give or not, nine times out of 10, they don't give. A lot of people in the body of Christ only give to churches because they the, the way that the tithe is taught as mandatory, right? And the reality is, is all of this stuff is, is voluntary. The most high gave you the, the best gift he ever gave you was to choose. You could choose to do none of this. You could choose to do all of it, right? Beyond all of that, the core of what is being looked at behind everything you do or you don't do is your heart, right? It's matters of the heart. But you got people who give tithes and they only give it because it's tax deductible depending on who they're giving to. You got people who give tithes, they only do it because they feel like they're supposed to. It's from a place of, ob ob uh, excuse me, it's from a place of obligation and not pure love to see others do well. And you got people who don't give a tithe because they feel like, oh, I don't want to sow here, I don't want to sow there, different things like that, right? It gets tricky. May the most I deal with you accordingly and give you understanding. How my family does it is because of passages like this and the, and the conviction of the father, I just simply set up a tithe account. I know of the money and the increase that the father has given me. I take out the portion of the tithe and that account is like my storehouse account. I've got individuals that have reached out to us and they, they, they receive support, whether it's for a school, uh, bills, rent, whether people got like car issues, like there's different things. And because the father says, if it's in your power to do good and someone asks you, don't tell them, go and come, come back. Right. Like the obligation is to do it and be compelled from a place of love. So that tithe account is where we have our storehouse. So that way we can do the work of what the tithe is supposed to be for, which is to take care of the widows and the orphans and those who have need. Right. And we can release that unto them. And I've seen the most I continue to bless. If we are visiting a congregation and the most I has given us that stamp of approval and said, like, you know, this is good ground. We'll release it that way. Right. But at the end of the day, the conviction that we hold based on the law and based on what the prompting of the Holy Spirit was before I came into context with these texts of the commandments. Right. Was that you shouldn't sow everywhere. But that tithe is there because like, there's so many people out here in need. In the book of James, it tells us, like, what good is it to do to just tell someone to go about their way? If they're naked and destitute of food and just say, like, you pray, like, no, it says meet those needs and then they will hear the gospel. They'll, then they'll be open to receive. Right. So it has a purpose. And I pray like if your understanding has been off on that, that the father will fix that. Right. Because there's people that do a lot of work out here and there's a portion of what the father has given you that does not belong to you. It belongs for the work of the kingdom. And if you're not doing the work of the kingdom, then those who are doing the work of the kingdom and that portion that is set aside, which belongs to the most high is to be delivered unto those who are out there being the hands and the feet and doing the work amongst the trenches and amongst the people. So that way they can they can put those programs in place so we don't have to be dis dependent. We can establish the system of through the kingdom, like the, the, the body of Christ, the tithing system is supposed to be the welfare system for the body of Christ. If it was done properly, right, families would not need to be on snap programs or ebt programs because the bot like nobody in the body of christ should be on those programs because the body of christ is supposed to be taking care of them to the degree where they don't need that stuff right but even believers are selfish all right so picking back up at verse 15 however you may slaughter and eat meat within all your gates whatever your heart desires according to the blessing of the lord your god which he has given you the unclean and the clean may eat of up of it talking about people of the gazelle and the deer of light. Gazelle and deer are both clean foods. It's talking about the unclean and clean because there are things that can make you unclean in the body of Christ. And he's saying, that's what he's addressing here, right? Don't confuse him that to be saying, oh, you can eat unclean food. That, that doesn't make sense, all right? Verse 16, only you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it on the earth like water. You may not eat within your gates the tithe of your grain or your new wine or your oil of the firstborn of your herd of your flock, or of any of the offerings which you vow of your free will offerings, or of the heave offering of your hand. But you must eat them in the place you must eat them before the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses. You and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, and the Levite who is within your gates, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all to which you put your hands. 
All right, so verse 16, you shall not eat the blood. That's what people like to love. They love to debate about stuff like that, right? Steaks that are undercooked, like, <laughs> well done. The Bible talks about well done, right? When you're talking about rare, medium rare, medium well, like medium, like there's a reason. So when you go to a restaurant and you cook your stuff, let, let me tell you something. There's an asterisk by that stuff. And if you look at the asterisk by your steaks and by your sushi, because sushi is raw, it's uncooked, right? Go to the bottom of the menu because they have to tell you, right? And it says consuming raw or uncooked or undercooked products could be hazardous to your health. When it's talking about this right here, you shall not eat the blood. Partially what it's talking about is like cook your food. Right. So when you're eating stuff like sushi and you're eating stuff that is like rare, medium rare stuff that's like uh, I, I heard I don't eat ham, but I heard somebody order light ham the other day. That means it's not fully cooked ham. You know what I'm saying? So like. You, you're, you're eating with the, you're eating the blood with the food and you're not supposed to do that. All right. So that nullifies that argument. People talk about tasting everything. If, if you got a well done steak and it's tough, it's because you didn't cook it right. You got to learn how to cook. Got to learn how to stink. Like you got to learn how to cook. Right. Learn how to cook it. Don't don't let your inability to cook or other people's inability to cook be the reason why you transgress the commandment, right? Deal with that. All right. So, verse 17. It's talking about not eating of your grain, your wine, or your oil, the firstborn of your flock, any offerings which you vow, or excuse me, the tithe of that stuff, your free will offerings. In other words, if it's reserved for God, don't touch it. I have personal testimonies. I won't get into it. You touch that tithe and the money that is that is vowed or portioned out to be for the mo the most high God or the work that he's doing or that work that he's called you to do. You touch it and watch what he does to you. All right. He ain't going to destroy you. Right. But. It's going to get real tight financially <laughs> until like he going to get his he going to get his back with interest. All right. And he's going to put you back in that position to remind you why you're supposed to be a, a, a vessel that freely releases what he's giving you to release them because you will forget and if you forget he'll remind you all right don't forget the levite who is within your gates that is in verse 18 right again take care of those who are doing the work right you got traveling ministers evangelists and everything um there's some brothers who used to come on campus and i, I would just ask them like have y'all brothers eaten today because they would be out there spreading the word and they'd be like, nah, so I would just go and I have my little snack drawer and I'd be busting, breaking out and giving food and stuff like that. You're supposed to take care of those people that are doing the work. It don't mean you give them all your hard-earned money and make them rich. It's, but you need to make sure like their stuff is met. You know what I'm saying? Um, verse 21, I'll say this. And then I think this is where we can go ahead and start to wrap it up. And I'll, I'll close it back out with verse 28 as a reminder, right? But in verse 21, and I'm hitting on this one because a lot of people will say, oh, well, you can't like when it just comes down to feast days or Sabbath and different things like that. Some people say, well, you can't test me. They'll say, well, you can't keep the Sabbath because you're not in Israel or you can't keep the feast days because you're not in Israel and different things like this. Right. Verse 21. If the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from your herd and your flock which the Lord has given you just as I have commanded you and you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires. Right. If it's too far from you, like there's a provision right there for that. If the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, then you may slaughter from your herd and your flock, which the Lord has given you just as I have commanded you and you may eat within your gates as much as your heart desires. So don't be deceived if somebody says, oh, well, you can't keep the Sabbath because a lot of New Testament believers will do that. Like, well, you can't because of X, Y, and Z. No, that's not what he said. He said, if it's too far away, you can do it right where you are. And this also connects, again, with what we talked about earlier, that what Christ has said to the woman at the well. No longer will it say, like, when she's like, where did we go and do this offering? He's like, you must worship me in spirit and truth. Right? Because that last temple was broken down. Prophetically, and it was fulfilled that it would be broken down. Right? So, you don't have to be there to do it. The law right here tells you if you can't get there, if it's too far away, do it where you are. Because the Most High is more concerned with the fact that you're even attempting to do it, if that makes any sense. Right? Verse 29 through 32. All right. So, and it says, And when the Lord your God cuts off from them before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you just place them and dwell in their land, take heed for it. All right. So then I'll get on this real quick. All right. So then also just straightforward when it is because we're in a season where all these different holy days are about to start popping up. You got the, the worldly holy days and, and the biblical holy days, right? 
a lot of people get into these different aspects, especially when it comes around to Christmas and different things. And they're like, well, this, the, even though the Bible doesn't talk about it, I choose to do it X, Y, Z. And I always ask this question. I say, well, who gave you that day? Because nobody just randomly woke up. Like, you don't just wake up and you're 12 years old and you're like, you know what? December 25th is going to be the day I choose to celebrate Jesus' birthday or the Messiah's birthday. Right? Somebody told you that day. Somebody gave you that day. Like, the dates, Easter, all that other stuff. Somebody gave us those dates and said, this is the day that you're going to call a holiday, which is Holy Day. You're going to celebrate this Holy Day on this date at this time. Check into that. Because the Most High said, when you go to dispossess these nations and displace them and dwell in their land, Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will do so likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates. They have done to their gods, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you to be careful to observe it, you shall not add to it nor take away. Understand that. When they say this is the day that you're going to celebrate X, Y, and Z, it's in violation of this. People feel like like don't, all of those days are in the Bible, right? But when you see that stuff in the Bible, it's typically summed up here when he says, whatever they did, don't bring that over here. I have given you days. I have given you holidays. I have given you things to celebrate and do throughout the year that all glorify the Messiah, that all bear witness to the God of Israel. This other stuff doesn't. When you really look into the origin of it, and you have a lot of people, look, I've done seminary stuff, right? You had a lot of people from who have seminary degrees, and they will sit here and say, well, they will try to justify the, 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 the confusion of it. But if you understand the history of it, the fusion of it was done to usurp the structure of what was established in the text, Right? So that way it could be assimilated, watered down, and we got what we have now, where the law is done away with, in theory, when the scripture says it's not. So then people, I'm telling you, man, this stuff gets deep. So there's, there's a progressive washing away of the standard. It starts with days like this. It starts with removing things like Sabbath. It starts with removing things like the biblical holidays and replacing them with carnal holidays. Because that allows people to start to pick and choose, and it cultivates what the Bible said in verse 8. Um... Every man shall do what is right in his own eyes. It doesn't seem like that stuff is connected, but it's all connected because the enemy is very strategic and he has to gradually do it over time. So when he starts to make this concession here and this concession there and this concession there, it, it, can, it, can, it uh, cultivates a mindset in the believer that, OK, well, if this right here says X, Y and Z and I still do it, then I can do the same thing here. That's why when you try to get into debate about tattoos with believers, believers will say, well, the Bible also says you shouldn't eat, uh, you shouldn't eat medium well steak, but people eat medium well steak. You see what I'm saying? That's how that works. So when this stuff is presented, you have to stand on it. Well, I know that the origin of that day is this, but I, I make it mean this. There's a way that seems right in his own eyes, in a man's own eyes, but the ender of his death. Doesn't matter how you try to see it. What did the father say? How he sees it. And what he said was, I don't care how you see it. This is how I see it. And I told you from the jump, when you go into that land and don't look at what they do and say, how can I bring this to my house? Because that's what believers today will do. They'll say, well, I know it's originated here, but I, the way I touch it up to bring it up. And then you try to stamp the Messiah on it as though that makes it OK. Just because you stamp the Messiah on it doesn't make it OK. You violating the commandment, and you try to put his name on it. You bearing false witness. That's another violation. If you don't subscribe to the law of God, you subscribe to the Ten Commandments, even if you don't subscribe to the Sabbath. If there's something that the Bible says not to do and you do it and you say because of the Messiah, it's OK. You have just borne false witness. If that makes any sense. So he says, don't do that. Right. And then people are like, OK, well, then what about it says they even burn their sons and their daughters to the fire and in the fire to their gods. People have no idea what this looks like today. And I'm just going to be straight up playing because there's no other way to do it, right? When you see them videos of these little babies at birthday parties and they out there dancing and they quoting songs from Sexy Red and people like that, that's how you see that scripture in today's society. You are not instructing your children in the ways of the Most High God. You allow them to be offered up to the gods of this earth, right? The, 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 the enemy was known as a fallen star. And when you see the scriptures, the, the, the angels are typically referred to as stars and different things like that, right? 
So you have these celebrities, right? These people that we celebrate, these people that we give praise, these people who are viewed as stars, right? And you allow these stars to pour into your children. You willfully offer your children up to these things that are, pro that are socializing them and teaching them the ways of the kingdom of Satan, contrary to this, the things of the father. And the father said, that's not what you should do. That's not what you do, right? That being said, that's all I got, all right? Verse 28, observe and obey all these words which I command you that it may go well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. Verse 27, you're going to see this parallel to Christ. And you shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God. And the blood of your sacrifice shall be poured on the altar of the Lord your God and you shall eat the meat, right? People who talk about the Messiah, people who are Old Testament only talk about the Messiah and say, I'm not going to eat the, the, the flesh or drink the blood and different things like that. Because they're missing the spirit of what the Messiah was saying, right? The Last Supper, which people turn into communion, which is really dealing with Passover, right? He said, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. You got to understand what he's talking about, right? You shall offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God, and the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall eat the meat. So he was telling them when he says, eat of my flesh, right? What he's telling them is he was saying, I am the sacrifice. When he's talking about drinking of the blood, what he's talking about is he's, he's affirming that he is the sacrifice. And when you are consuming these things, right, not literally, but like he's saying, like when you're doing these things in the spirit, you are attesting and affirming your faith and your belief in me that I am the sacrifice. I am the offering that was come to be poured out for you. If that makes sense. Right. And again, summing it back up in verse 28, it says, observe and obey all these words which I command you. Why? That it may go well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. I'll praise to the Most High God of Israel for the reading of his word. May he grant understanding. May he water and give increase. Shalom.